In the past few weeks, over one billion Roman Catholics have mourned the death of Pope John Paul II and anticipated the arrival of his successor. Today, on The John Akerberg Show, you will hear a debate on the topic, Did Jesus Christ Establish the Office of Pope Over the Christian Church? My guests who will debate this question are Father Mitchell Pacwa, a Jesuit professor and an ordained Roman Catholic priest, and the late Dr. Walter Martin, a Protestant scholar. The Pope's infallibility does not mean is that the Pope is right all the time. In no way does the Catholic Church even teach that. He's infallible only when he speaks ex cathedra in order to clearly speak infallibly. He has to say that. In order to establish what you just said, you mm -hmm. must assume that there is a papacy with the power to do that. Yes. Ah, well, I deny the assumption. The Roman Catholic Church claims that Jesus made Peter the Pope and gave him and his successors supreme power in faith and morals over every person in the Christian Church. But is this true? Why did the Apostle Paul never mention the office of the Pope in any of his epistles? And did Jesus give the same keys to the kingdom to the other apostles that he gave to Peter? Today, you will hear both sides of these questions. We invite you to join us. Good evening. Good evening. Tonight we're examining the claims uh, and the authority, the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. I want to move on this week, the infallibility of the Pope. And let's actually take a look at this. And uh, reading from Vatican uh, Council, which met in Rome in 1870, they said, We teach and define that it is a dogma divinely revealed that the Roman pontiff, when he speaks ex cathedra, that is, when in discharge of the office of pastor and doctor of all Christians, by virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, he defines a doctrine regarding faith and morals to be held by the universal church, by the divine assistance promised him in blessed Peter, is possessed of that infallibility with which the divine redeemer willed that his church should be endowed for defining doctrines regarding faith and morals, and that therefore such definitions of the Roman pontiff of themselves and not by virtue of the consent of the church are irreformable. Now, we need to keep coming back for evidence. Uh, many in the Roman Catholic Church take it for granted that that's true, but there are others that do not. And Father Pacwa, I'd like you to comment about the fact of if Jesus gave the supremacy to uh, Peter, uh, how do you deal with Paul? Because let me give you a few facts about Paul in relationship to Peter. I'd like you to comment, if you would, please. Peter has no say in Paul's appointment. There are 13 epistles that Paul wrote, 2,023 verses. Peter only wrote two epistles and 166 verses. Mm -hmm. Paul mentioned Peter more than once, but he never mentioned him with any special title of honor, such as the vicar or pope, or above any of the other apostles. Paul did not mention the papacy when he referred to the offices of the church in 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4. Paul, as an apostle, claimed authority over the Roman church itself in Romans chapter 1, 5 through 6, and 16, 17. Uh, Paul claimed for himself that he was behind the very chiefest apostles in nothing, 2 Corinthians 12. And that uh, then, specifically, you have Paul rebuking Peter without any mention of Peter's supremacy in Galatians 2. Now, if Peter was the chief... It would seem that Paul would have acknowledged that in his epistles and would have acknowledged it in the respect he gave when there was a matter of doctrine on the table. Mm -hmm. We see none of that for Peter. First of all, you know, what you have in Paul and Peter's dispute in Galatians again, is not a dispute about some infallible statement by Peter. Okay? So it's, by his own, it's about his own practice okay. on something that already had been decided by the church. Now, Catholics do not say that we can't tell the Pope to live up to certain things in his own life. As a matter of fact, Dante, you know, when in, his, in his Inferno, mentions that a number of Popes are in hell for various reasons. And, you know... Remember, and you, no, sa you said that. I didn't. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, well, why not say it? You know, I don't know that they're in hell. Dante knew. Um, so he says. And, and the thing that, you know, the, the Pope's infallibility 
does not mean is that the Pope is right all the time. In no way does the Catholic Church even teach that. He's infallible only when he speaks ex cathedra in order to clearly speak infallibly. He has to say that explicitly that he's speaking infallibly. Secondly, it has to be to the whole church, not to one part or one individual of the church, but to everybody in the church. And thirdly, it has to be on the issue of faith and morals. He cannot infallibly say okay. that the stock market will okay. rise. Okay, you, you, con you have continued to tell me about the fact of what he speaks. When I'm right. saying the word supreme seems to also mean more than just what he speaks. There ought to be the respect, there ought to be the dignity, the honor, the mention of the fact of his office by all the other apostles. And we see none of that. There's, it's silent, dead silence in the New Testament. I, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, uh, um, I don't, and again, I don't think that it is, it is not dead silent. Okay, again, even Paul, Would you Paul, show me he, where it is? Paul does not call him Simon by Jonah, does he? What does he call him? Peter. Kephas. Peter. Peter. Kephas or Peter. And is that... Which is a title given him, which is rock, not his given name. And he doesn't refer to him as Simon, ever but always calls him by Kephas. And even in Corinthians, the, what he's dealing with is a specific problem of people having been divisive on account of Peter. And later on, in the next generation, about 35 years later, you're going to see, well, actually, more than that from Corinthians, about 45 years later, we'll see that it'll be the Bishop of Rome, St. Clement I, who's the, the, the second after Peter and Paul, who will be correcting the same church because of division. They never learned. And so it's the Bishop of Rome that takes that authority in 95 AD, before the New Testament is finished being written. And he's the one that tells them, that he sends legates over there to Corinth and says, you Corinthians, get united with your priests again. And he orders his legates not to come back home until they're united. So he takes that authority in the very next generation as the role of Peter to bring unity to the church. I want to quote Vatican II, John. Okay, come is, back to that. Vatican I, I mean. Come back to that in a flash, but uh, I'd like for you to put the other side of the fence. I said uh, that there was a hypothesis that uh, uh, Father Pacwa is using, namely that in referring to Peter, which we all agree is small rock, and that there's a differentiation between the other rock, there is something different. It's not referring to Peter because of the way it's written. All right, what would be another option that would seem to fit this evidence better from your point of view? Would you please explain that so we get it on the table anyway? I would take Augustine's position, All right. uh, a very great theologian, that Peter's confession of faith, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, is the foundation. Uh, and that it's not Peter. Cross-referencing at the first Peter chapter 2, Peter didn't understand it to refer to him. He put himself in with all the rest of the little stones built up into the spiritual house, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Ephesians 2.20 says, we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. He quotes scripture, behold I lay in Zion, a cornerstone, a rock of offense. Whoever believes on him, not Peter, Christ will not be ashamed. That Peter was uh, a moving force, a chief apostle in the church, there's no doubt whatsoever, that his writings were authoritative and they were accepted as such, that he recommended Paul's writings as scripture, even calling it scripture, equating it with the Old Testament, is indicative of the fact that they agreed in their basic theology. Well, since they agreed in their basic theology, uh, the facts fit the hypotheses that the whole structure of the New Testament and the first five centuries following that, historically, did not give any supreme uh, role to the Bishop of Rome. Okay, now I, gotta, was, I want you to go on and, and let's get into a definition of the keys. Okay, Father Pacwa has defined how the Roman yeah. Catholic Church sees the yeah. keys, and yeah. uh, would you give another uh, hypothesis for that? Yes, the alternative to that is the parallel passage of Matthew 18, with which he is well acquainted also, and mentioned it before. Namely, that Christ was speaking to the disciples, not to Peter, and the apostles in general. And he said, uh, if any two of you shall agree on anything on earth, it will have been done in heaven. It should bind on earth, bound in heaven. Now, the keys of the kingdom were the power to bind and loose. Peter had that power, but it wasn't Peter's power alone. Matthew 18 gives that power to you and to me 
to pray together that we might bind or loose. So uh, I take that to be the alternative proposition. Would you say that the Roman binding Catholic and loosing position. is a declaratory power and not one of uh, supremacy? Yeah, I think it's a right to declare something by faith, and I think Peter had that right. But if he was really the supreme pontiff of the church, this is a very strong point, I think, then the disciples of the apostles, the men who went into the second century, the great theologians of that time, would surely have recognized the primacy of Rome. And they didn't. Okay, Father Paco, would you respond to that hypothesis? Why do you think that uh, the evidence of the New Testament does not fit that hypothesis? First of all, you know that when Jesus is speaking in Matthew 18, he's not speaking to the crowds, but to the apostles. Right. And so that, you know, it's not just we who have that same authority, except in a derived sense, but the apostles and their successors, the bishops, along with the successor of Peter, have that authority to make decisions that we don't. For instance, decisions like what goes into the New Testament. That was not made by the New Testament. It was made by the bishops. They chose which books were to be canonical. The lay people didn't do it, except in that secondary sense. The bishops were the ones who were the traditores, that is, the ones who carried on the tradition as to which books derived from Paul, Peter, James, and the others. And then finally, in councils, and a series of councils, you know, decided which ones we now, we now have the 27. And really, it was not until Pope Damasus I, in, you know, in giving authority to the councils of Carthage and Hippo, in the end of the 4th century and beginning of the 5th, so that, that we had the first time 27 books of the New Testament. Before that, we have 22 books, so that the authority of the New Testament derives from these bishops and for the pope, to, and that an authority which Protestants you know, continue to accept as, as their own basic authority. The okay, let's, let's there's get a, a response. There's, there's a severe fallacy in the reasoning. Mm -hmm. In order to establish what you just said, you mm -hmm. must assume that there is a papacy with the power to do that. Yes. Ah, well, I deny the assumption. Yes. So, so, so for me, so it's a fallacy it, only if I accept your assumption. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just as it's a fallacy if I accept that's, yours. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, so we're uh, stuck. Yes, we're stuck. <laughs> We're, we're stuck in one important area that I think we can get out of pretty quickly. Yeah. We're, we're stuck in one important area that I think we can get out of pretty quickly. Yeah. This is it. At Vatican I, which was the cornerstone of all the power of the contemporary papacy. Uh, we know that because it was then at Vatican I, which John just read, mm -hmm. that the statement was clearly defined for the first time mm -hmm. in history sure. that this was the position, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, when that was done, at Vatican I, on July 13th, 1870, mm -hmm. an argument was raised on the floor, voted on by 18 bishops supporting it. Mm -hmm. And this was what was stated historically, if I may quote it. Well, venerable brethren, history raises its voice to assure us that popes have erred. You may protest against it or deny it as you please. I'll prove it. Pope Victor in 192 first approved of Montanism and then condemned it. Marcellinus was an idolater. He entered the temple of Vesta and offered incense to the goddess. You will say that it was an act of weakness, but I answer a vicar of Jesus Christ dies rather than become an apostate. Hadrian II declared civil marriages to be valid. Pius VII condemned them. Sixtus V published an edition of the Bible and by a bull recommended it to be read. Pius VII condemned the reading of it. Clement the Fourteenth abolished the order of the Jesuits. That's you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he died. Universal Church, bye bye. Okay, <laughs> you're out. Permitted by Paul the Third and Pius the Seventh. Put you boys back in business. Right. <laughs> Pope Vigilius purchased the papacy from Belisarius, lieutenant to the Emperor of Justinian. But you will tell me these are fables, not history. Fables. Go, Monsignori, to the Vatican Library and read Platina, the historian of the papacy, in the annals of Baronius. These are facts which, for the honor of the Holy See, we would wish to ignore. Cardinal Baronius, speaking of the papal court, said, What did the Roman church appear in those days? How infamous. 
only an all-powerful courtesans governing in Rome. It was they who gave, exchanged, and took bishoprics, and horrible to relate, got their lovers, the false popes, put on the thrones of St. Peter. Okay, we've got to call, call an end to it here, Walter. We need a, a statement for Father Paqua here. What do you have to say concerning these things? Well, uh, this is we, by an archbishop, not I me. know, I know, and that's, we don't deny it at all. You know, again, that's the basis on which Dante said some of these folks are going to be in hell. So what, and what, that we, infallibility does not mean justification. No. What I, what I hear you saying is that uh, all the statements that the popes made that are proven wrong, they're mm -hmm. not infallible. Right. And the, also you're saying... They don't saying, meet the three criteria for infallibility. Yeah, and the fact is that uh, in spite of the fact that Peter is supposed to be supreme, not just in the fact of what he said, but supposedly recognized as such, the head of the church, mm -hmm. the leader, when he speaks, they ought to be some respect and listening, okay? And you would expect that he would be leading in some other areas as well. We still have yet to establish the fact that you find that in Scripture. You still have yet to uh, discount the fact that the other apostles were given the same ability. You still have yet to discount the fact that Paul, uh, in looking at Peter, never mentions it, never writes to him, uh, mentioning the fact that he's the head of the church, mm -hmm. and uh, well, on and on and on. Well, well see, the, the, the problem with your on and on and on is that you, know, you don't accept you know, the, the, the Catholic you know, understanding of, of well, you know, pointing out of all the data where Peter is head. As a matter of fact, as, as Dr. Martin himself said, that Peter clearly takes the dynamic leadership of the church after the ascension of Jesus. For, for and three chapters, and then it, he three disappears. Three chapters and chapter 10. But, but in chapter 10, and he's disputing with the people that are there. They don't right. show him the honor that you're talking about. No, 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 no. You're the one that keeps on saying that supremacy means that everything you say is going to be honored. I'm not saying that. I'm saying yes, that they are. don't say that. I'm saying the respect. Okay. If the Pope were to walk into the door, he should have the final word in an argument. Why? Who said that? Jesus didn't say that. We what don't say that Jesus Supreme did. means first. First that, word, that last word. That doesn't mean in terms of, uh, you know, the way that it's going to be enacted, that he's going to have that. You're defining it as a straw man uh -huh. and then saying we don't have it. We never said that that's what it means. Just define, what it means define is, supreme for me then. When it, what it means is that when he speaks to the whole church in the name of Peter and on faith and morals, that that is infallible. But he's not the head then of the apostles. Uh, uh, he's the head of the church as well in terms of, you know, being the, the head of the... What does uh, head mean? How would they recognize it from the examples that are given in Scripture? Well, in terms of the examples in Scripture, his choosing of a, a replacement for Matthias, his being the first one to, uh, to go and lead John to lay hands on the Samaritans. To, so but he was be sent confirmed. out by the, the church to do that. Sure. And what's, he came back and they didn't just accept his word. They argued with him. So? I don't see the, him being the head. Again, his headship does not come from them and their approval. But they His didn't headship recognize. comes from the fact mm -hmm. that Jesus is the one who revealed oh, to him so now, that so, he should. So what you're saying is that, that the, he should the, be the, baptized so that the church him. didn't recognize it, but he still had it. Absolutely, because it comes from Christ, not from the church. But that's, but, a, that's one of the reasons why but then it's you're, said to be apostolic yeah. Let, and let's, divinely Let's instituted. follow that through. Is that he had it, but they didn't recognize it? Why didn't they recognize it if they were all there? I mean, Jesus never told anybody else. He only told Peter, and Peter never mentioned it. Look. This, in terms of recognizing things, did they recognize the, the existence of the New Testament yet? No. Did they recognize the definition of the Trinity? No. Did they recognize the two natures of Christ? No. In terms of ways that we could talk about today? No. Lots of things they don't recognize. Yeah, but we're and making... It, but over time... Did they recognize history, that Jesus was God? Yes. Did that the, go into the Chalcedonian and Nicene councils? Sure. Yes. There's a basis there. I'm saying I don't see any basis. Well, okay. You don't accept... You know, the, the evidence that we accept. Of, I don't see any evidence is what I'm saying. Christ, you don't see that Christ gives Peter this vision no, to go I baptize don't. Cornelius? Yeah, that's why I keep saying that the appeal of the fathers, the appeal of the fathers is not to the tradition of the church and not to the arguments that were uh, aroused and carried on vigorously amongst themselves. All of them, when they appeal, it's scriptura sola. They're appealing to Scripture, Scripture, Scripture. And what John's saying, what I'm saying is this. Uh, if you want to believe that the church made the Scripture, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. you have a problem because the kerygma, which was the preaching of the gospel, was not inscripturated uh, totally until the close of the first century. That's, so, no, that, that's not that, a problem. That, that, that's a strength yeah, no, of our position. Yeah, well, no, I don't think it is a strength because the fathers reproduced the entire New Testament virtually themselves in the next three centuries. 
Except the for fathers. Six, except for six verses. With the exception of, pardon? Six verses. So well, that's six verses. That's the fathers. If you had no church supervising mm -hmm. the, through the magisterium, the teaching ministry, the gathering together, mm -hmm. the information, putting it together, you still have the different fathers in different locations, all writing, all reproducing mm -hmm. the teachings of the apostles. You put it all together, and they knew that they had, from their own specific references, their own teachers, they knew that they had the Gospels right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They knew they had the Book of Acts right. Mm -hmm. So they subjected everything to the canon of the Gospels and Acts to test the epistles. Mm -hmm. Now, that's how they arrived at the information. It wasn't somewhere down the line at the year uh, 364. Stay tuned for scenes from next week's program. If